Tuesday, December 8, 2020. Welcome to the online ART training in module 1B on sperm morphology. It is 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. My name is Ashok Agarwal, and I'm going to be your host for the next two hours. We are here in Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, United States. Just uh, a very short uh, uh, introduction to myself. I am uh, the head of andrology laboratory at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio uh, for uh, past 28 years. I'm also the director of uh, the American Center for Reproductive Medicine. Um, I'm a staff in urology at Cleveland Clinic. And uh, I am very proud that our team is rated as number one in the world in the fields of male infertility, <clears throat> andrology, and human-assisted reproduction. This is based on the number of peer-reviewed publications, citation is course of people who are using our articles into their own publications, and an H index. These uh, together can be uh, searched by anybody in any part of the world using a Scopus. Um, we have a large number of books in the area of uh, human reproduction uh, and many more books are uh, going to be uh, coming in. And our laboratory has trained uh, a very large number of uh, scientists, clinicians and graduates and undergraduates from the United States and more than 85 countries. Um, so with these words, uh, I want to welcome all of you who are attending the program. Uh, we are expecting uh, a number of about 1,400, uh, some numbers, and I think you will see in the slide who have registered. Uh, the capacity of uh, WebEx uh, platform, which is being used to uh, to air this uh, program and reach out to all of you is uh, 1,000. Those who are not able to get in and who join a little bit late uh, will be able to see this program live uh, via the streaming uh, link which has been provided on the WhatsApp. For declaration, um, the organizers and the speakers uh, have no conflict of interest, no companies, or outside entities were contacted for sponsorship. The program was made entirely possible by support from the Cleveland Clinic. Webcasting was supported by our colleagues, David Reichling and David Wolfley from IT, who have generously supported our program last month as well. The course faculty have generously donated their time for this online training and have spent uh, pretty much uh, the entire one month preparing for this course, as you will hear. Program coordinators, we have uh, a fantastic team of uh, nine coordinators from all different parts of the world who have uh, generously donated a uh, large amount of their time on a day-to-day -day basis for this training. The names, images, and description of certain products or instruments shown or discussed during the lectures in today's presentation are being used routinely by us in the Andrology Lab. These items are not endorsed by any of us as the speakers. I want to tell you again, uh, for those who were not there in the program that we did on November 10, the idea for this online ART training uh, came sometimes about three months ago in the month of September. And all of a sudden, uh, we had this discussion among our team that we want to do something new. And uh, with the COVID thing going, um, uh, we really uh, are not able to offer the ART training, which has been uh, 
a hallmark of our program every year for the last 16, 17 years. Uh, during the month of uh, September, we used to offer this. So we um, put our uh, heads together and uh, thought of uh, an idea which uh, was to offer the highest quality educational experience in human assisted reproduction on a global scale using an online content delivery model. We wanted to raise the bar on quality of lab skills and theoretical knowledge in andrology and ART. And the reason that we chose that is because of our experience and the general consensus that the weakest link in the delivery of care to the infertile couple is really at the laboratory level. There is so much uh, of uh, lack of standardization and uh, also lack of understanding and knowledge uh, among uh, um, people who are working uh, very, very hard uh, in IVF labs and andrology labs in different parts of the world. Uh, and this has been documented and discussed uh, time and again. So we felt that there is really a need to reach out to the all the members of uh, laboratory teams which support the care of patients. And they are the unsung heroes and heroines who really support uh, the care of the patients provided by the clinicians. So if we can improve this foundation of uh, the clinical care, I believe and we believe that uh, this will raise uh, the quality of uh, care overall to our patient. So we chose the online ART training model because this is so attractive. Unlike uh, the physical training, which uh, was very, very limited, um, here we are able to reach uh, the entire world because of the power of internet. So we have the WebEx, which is our platform at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we have electronic mail, we have WhatsApp, where we have created all these uh, groups to, uh, to, to share the information about the training to more than 1,000, uh, 1,500 people who are with us now. And the Dropbox, where we are sharing protocols, articles, information about each uh, of these modules. So all in all, I think uh, the possibilities of online ART training appeal to me, appeal to all of us, and it seemed like this is limitless, and we really can do something which nobody has been able to do, or neither we were able to do all these years. So the format was we chose eight modules, which are a standard part of training in our program, and we divided them into 14 virtual sessions, keeping everything very short, so not to create uh, too much information in each uh, of these training sessions. The registration was completely free and to allow maximum participation. And uh, we also um, provided a certificate of participation, which is issued by our center and endorsed by the College of American Embryology. The faculty were, are all experts in andrology and human assisted reproduction from our center and our colleagues, which we have selectively invited. The format is to provide uh, very interactive lectures, not a traditional lectures. These are lectures which, as you will see and notice, are deeply ingrained into our laboratory workings and provide uh, information in great detail. Multiple choice questions at the end to test the knowledge of uh, each participant who choose to take this test and sharing of important reading material and technical protocols freely on Dropbox. So this is uh, the, the circle here you can see on the right. We started with routine semen analysis, which is uh, divided into several modules. Today is, uh, is one of the module, and then we have another in January. Then we move to advanced sperm function test, at, and then several modules related to uh, IVF and embryology laboratory procedures. The criteria for certificate of participation include a MCQ test or multiple choice, where we have 40 to 50 questions which are uh, uh, extracted from the content covered in each online module. 
the candidates have approximately 20 seconds to answer each question. The passing of uh, this test for this module is going to be equal or greater than 65% of correct answers. Unlike in the first module where we lowered the bar to 60% to allow people to get familiar with the platform, uh, we are going to gradually raise this and this is uh, uh, which we, we feel uh, is appropriate. There is no negative marking. Uh, following that, the candidates will be asked to complete an online survey. This will be at the end of the M MCQ. Survey results are being used by our team to improve the organization of the next module. So we are learning as uh, we are receiving your feedback. So please do complete the survey. We have made number of changes from our last months based on the feedback that we have uh, seen from each and every one of you. These are the highlights of module 1A, which was held on November 10. The program was on semen analysis held on November 10. We had a registration of about 1,337 candidates. Out of that, uh, about uh, 1,000 of them were able to join the online platform, WebEx. We don't know the exact number on streaming because the data is not available for that. And these candidates joined from 66 countries. Um, and then the following day, because we had a problem for having the MCQ on the same day, our website crashed, but we held the program next day for the multiple choice. And uh, about 633 candidates took the test. And out of that, uh, 81% or 515 uh, passed the test. Congratulations to them. And uh, those are the candidates who have been awarded a special certificate of participation. So congratulations. I want to introduce or reintroduce Professor Ralph Henkel. Uh, Professor Henkel is uh, a visiting reader in the Department of Metabolism uh, and Digestion in the Imperial College in London. He has moved there uh, very recently. He is also the chief scientific advisor at a company called Logix Pharma in Reading. And uh, he is an extraordinary, actually he is an extraordinary man and extraordinary professor of reproductive biology uh, at Western Cape University in South Africa, where he was for uh, past, uh, I believe, close to 20 years before he moved from Germany. Uh, his wife is from South Africa. Professor Henkel, more importantly, is an editor-in-chief of Endologia, one of the most prestigious and original journal in the field of andrology. He is uh, a highly decorated uh, andrologist uh, of uh, great stature and a very humble man and a great friend of our program. We have been collaborating actively for the last uh, number of years, and he has been visiting us for uh, for uh, the summer every year since uh, of the covid he could not uh, visit but hopefully next year he will be here so i will start this uh, presentation which has been recorded good morning good afternoon good evening everybody wherever you are my name is ralf henkel and I'm Chief Scientific Advisor to Logix Pharma in Reading in the UK. And I also hold a visiting readership at the Imperial College London. I present my presentation on importance of strict criteria and assisted reproduction. The learning objectives of this lecture is to understand the value of sperm morphology in the diagnostic workup of infertile men to learn about the WHO fifth edition reference ranges for normal uh, morphological forms of spermatozoa, understand the pros and cons in the relationship between strict criteria and assisted reproduction, as well as to recognize current consensus on the clinical value of sperm morphology. If we talk about fertilization, we must first understand that this whole process is a multifactorial process. And on the side of the spermatozoa, all these different functions of the sperm 
play a significant role. And if one of these functions is low range, then this will lead to poor fertilization and pregnancy failure. Morphology, which is here, plays one part of this whole cascade of different sperm functions. And it is associated with these other different uh, sperm functions. But where does this concept of normal sperm morphology come from? If we look at the cervical mucus, both sperm that we can find in V and at spermatozoa that are bound to the zona pellucida here on the right hand side. Uh, this, the, the, this sperm that ca could, can be found there led actually Professor Mengfeld from Tigerberg Hospital in South Africa to the idea to investigate what is happening there. And looking at specifically at the zona pellucida, the zona pellucida is binding normally formed sperm, which has a specific binding capacity, whereas not normally formed sperm will not bind. And all this background led him to, uh, to develop this concept of strict morphological criteria for spermatozoa, the def clear definition of uh, sizes and the morphometry. He, will, he was then further developing this whole concept. And this will be discussed and presented in a uh, following lecture. But at this stage, I just want to say that all these different criteria have to be met to actually count a spermatozoan as normal. But what does it mean? And what importance does a normally formed spermatozoan has? If we look at the sperm morphology, uh, if it is impaired, it can give an indication of possible abnormal genetic condition. And here I just want to mention globosospermia, that is spermatozoa, that have a sperm head that is round like a football and not overly shaped. This is uh, indicating of a, a genetic abnormality. Then we have, for instance, small acrosomes like here, they or they. This indicates that these sperm are dead, they are not viable. On the other hand, here these elongated sperm heads, they and they, they are an indication that that patient has a varicocele, which can then be medically treated. On the other hand, normal sperm morphology is not dependent on the prolonged on the abstinence, whereas other parameters such as uh, ejaculatory volume or sperm count or even DNA fragmentation, they are related to the uh, abstinence period. So in general, we can then say that normal sperm morphology indicates the male fertilizing potential and gives the probability of fertilization and pregnancy after spontaneous and assisted reproduction outcome. It will also give you a need of further treatment of specific patients and the possible techniques that can then be used in the embryological uh, lab. But where does this all come from and how does it, did it actually develop over the time? If we look at the history and see from the WHO, which developed and published uh, different um, guidelines as from 1980 and what, what there was the first guideline published and the latest now was in 2010, the fifth guideline. What we can see specifically for morphology, the cutoff values dropped dramatically from 80.5% to currently 4%. The question is why did the 
sperm morphology or did the quality of main sperm decline so dramatically or what happened there? If we look closer, we see that in the first editions of the WHO manual, there was a liberal approach. And it was more like observations that took place. Then in the early 1990s, Mengfeld introduced the strict criteria, which was then based on the normal forms that were found at the zona pellucida and in the uh, cervical mucus. Later in the 99 uh, edition of the manual, uh, it dropped to 14%. Oops. And this was due to what was seen in the fertilization in the IVF program. And finally, the last drop to 4%. This is simply due to WHO moving from cutoff values to this lower reference values. And what we see here over the period of time, it was a the uh, significant decrease in so-called normal sperm morphology. And people then ask the question, what, where does it come from? What are the reasons for this to happen? And initially they thought there's a negative environmental influence. What is what we can see there's overall, there's also a decline in male fertility, yes. But here in this study by Ariagno, where they analyzed or reanalyzed the slides that, and studies from all these years where they found a, the deep drop in uh, morphology, yes, but after reanalyzing, uh, there was no change. So one can conclude that this drop, what we can see here, is simply due to implementation of strict criteria and adherence to it, and sometimes also overcritical evaluation, or even that some more abnormalities were identified because people were more interested in morphology and they looked more closer to what was happening there. So, and eventually it was a more evidence-based uh, approach that also contributed to this decrease. What we can see with regard to the impact of morphology is that there's a highly significant impact on fertilization. Patients with high morphology rates here with more than 4%, they have higher fertilization rate than those patients with low um, morphology. And further, there's also been considerations that and papers published that say morphology doesn't play such a role. So in the following slides, I want to highlight and throw some light on all these pros where people say morphology has a predictive value and is on, based on evidence-based data and on, also on the cons, which is we must understand the pros and cons so the studies were published where morphology has poor or no predictive value, and they also show evidence. Let's start with the pros for morphology. What we can see here in these studies here by Kruger et al., he could clearly show that there was a significant relationship with higher fertilization rates in patients with higher normal morphology. And that was here the cut, oops, the cut of 14%. Of in a subsequent study, he further analyzed this group uh, that had lower uh, fertilization rate, less than 14%, and found there's two groups with those at between 5% and 14%, which had fertilization rate which was close to what was observed uh, in patients higher with the fertilization the pregnant no, with uh, morphology rates higher than 14 percent 
uh, and those that had morphology rates less than 5%, which has then poor fertilization rates. And this was then called a P pattern for poor uh, morphology pattern and G pattern for good morphology pattern. If we look further here in a study by Nginzu, including uh, 200 patients, these authors could also clearly show a significant relationship between normal sperm morphology here as a correlation coefficient. It was really significant with 14%, the conventional uh, cutoff value and the strict criteria. And if we look at this strict criteria here at the bottom, we can see this relationship in terms of the uh, correlation coefficient is significantly better than that for the 14%. And here also the likelihood ratio for the onset of a pregnancy is much higher than for the 14%. In a further study, Obara et al. also showed a highly significant positive correlation between normal morphology and fertilization rate. And they confirmed those data previously published by Kruger et al. The higher uh, fertilization rates were observed in patients with normal sperm morphology when compared with both with good prognosis pattern and poor prognosis pattern where basically no uh, fertilization took place. So take, summarizing these uh, takeaways for the pro side, we can say that sperm morphology evaluation using the strict criteria is a good predictor of in vitro fertilization. And with these criteria, we can also select couples who may benefit from intrauterine insemination. On the other hand, strict criteria also offer a reliable estimation of fertilizing ability uh, of human spermatozoa. On the other hand, those more recent studies, they are rather um, critical to the implementation of strict criteria and morphology at all. Here I show a study by Hoteling of 2001. These authors included more than 2,800 IVF and ICSI cycles with quite a number of uh, teratozoospermic patients. And with the exception of this study here by Dubai et al. of 2008, uh, the odds ratios here do not look great. And as a consequence, Hoteling et al. Uh, concluded that sperm morphology is not a good predictor of fertilization after assisted reproduction. In another study, Van den Hoven 2015 basically confirmed this in a separate uh, investigations for IVF and ICSI. And for morphology, there was basically no um, significant relationship with, for pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy and abortion, and only here for the total progressive motile sperm count. Um, after ICSI, that was a bit significant. And yeah, here also for normal morphology, but if you look at the odds ratio, they are not great. So these authors then also concluded that sperm morphology has poor or uh, no prognostic value for the pregnancy outcome after IVF or ICSI. In the third study, also including more than a thousand ICSI cycles, these authors, French et al. 2008, compared the clinical pregnancy rates in patients with different levels of normal morphology for 
year uh, clinical pregnancy rate, there is basically no change. The implantation rate, the, these light blue uh, bars, basically no change. And the live birth rate, there was also no change. So also these authors also concluded that morphology, even using strict criteria, had no or little a prognostic value, specifically in this case after ICSI. So here the main takeaway message is that if we look at the cutoff, um, the evolution of sperm morphology led to the lower cutoff values has decreased the predictive power. Well, these studies have also limitations because they are quite heterogeneous groups of studies. There is uh, different staining methods was used. Some groups use the Papa Nicolaou, other groups use the diff quick. The next group was also using the aniline blue stain. Um, all these are factors that have to be looked at. If we specifically look at ICSI, uh, the use of one single sperm selected by the embryologist, which is then injected into the oocyte, actually bypasses all natural selection processes. And therefore, morphology seems to have no impact, except in the end, the DNA that must then be normal and there must be normal DNA integrity. But with regard to possible birth defects in ICSI, uh, there are still more studies are necessary to examine this association between possible birth defects, birth outcome, and the impact of sperm morphology. So summarizing this evidence that is there and comparing it on the pro side, there was studies that showed a clear, strong association of morphology with fertilization. Um, there's morphology together with the progressive motor sperm count helped with the selection of a patient to guide them into either IUI, IVF, or ICSI. And certain abnormalities can give then the clinician an indication what the, the reason for the infertility is. And of course, we have to look at the method, how the morpholo morphology is determined. So it must be done correctly in, in strict adherence to the WHO criteria. On the other hand, on the con side, there is clearly studies show a lack of consensus, whereas current studies have many shortcomings. Uh, there's low predictive value for IVF and ICSI. And this is because ICSI bypasses all natural selection uh, barriers. But if we compare normal spermatozoa versus an abnormal spermatozoa, normal sperm morphology, it only reflects normal spermatogenesis in the testis and normal epididymal maturation. And it also relates to likely functional potential, but does not necessarily equate to fertilizing ability. And the emphasis here is unlikely. On the other hand, morphologically abnormal sperm can, and they do, fertilize oocytes. And there we still have to understand the female genital tract and the mechanisms, how the female genital tract selects sperm much more than we do at the moment. So the take home message of this presentation is that strict criteria classification is based on the concept of natural selection at the um, zona pellucida and the cervical mucus, and it can predict fertilization ability. It gives an indication of the underlying pathology and thereby assisting the clinician uh, to guide the patient. It can also be used as a tool to choose the type of assisted reproduction technology in the laboratory to guide the patient uh, so that they have the better success. 
And therefore, this cutoff here with the lower reference value of 4%, if it is higher, then the patient can go for IUI or IVF. If it is lower, then the patient should rather go uh, for ICSI. Also, the standardized morphological assessment by strict criteria continues to remain relevant. Although there is the contrary uh, concepts in, in saying there is no uh, impact of normal sperm morphology for fertilization outcome, uh, it still helps guiding the patient and making clinical uh, decisions. And with this, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And this are uh, some slides from my repeated visits to Cleveland. And this is Hammersmith Hospital, where I am based at, in London at the moment. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Sejal Gupta. Uh, Dr. Gupta is uh, uh, the technical supervisor of our center in uh, Cleveland Clinic. Andrology Center for a number of years. Uh, she's a very young woman, so I wouldn't want to uh, tell you how long. And uh, she was not happy with one fellowship, so she did two of them, as you can see. Uh, but more importantly, she has been well, uh, uh, received many awards. Uh, she is also active besides her clinical duties on the research and has published a large number of papers. She's an assistant professor in the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. And uh, she will be uh, speaking on, uh, let's uh, go to the next. She will be speaking today on sperm morphology, step-by-step -step protocol. So she is going to walk us uh, through the uh, every little step that uh, needs to be taken uh, towards uh, uh, conducting the sperm morphological uh, preparation of the smear and staining and scoring. So Sejal, uh, you can begin. Thank you very much, Dr. Agro, for a nice uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to Dr. Henkel for an excellent presentation. And uh, he highlighted why it is extremely important to do correct sperm morphology. And correct sperm morphology can only be done by following standardized procedures. So my presentation is going to be on sperm morphology step-by-step -step protocol. And basically, I'll be presenting to you the standardized protocol for doing sperm morphology assessment. Next slide. Next. The learning objectives of my presentation are introduction to sperm morphology evaluation, preparation of the morphology smears, the staining methods, and what are the tips uh, that can optimize smear preparation staining and sperm assessment. Next time. So morphology assessment uh, reflects um, when it is done with bright field optical microscopy that there is a very uh, heterogeneous sperm morphological forms which result from spermiogenesis. So spermiogenesis is the process where the round spermatid will transform into the beautiful uh, long sperm with the head mid-piece and the neck. And when we look under the microscope, we find a variety of different morphological abnormalities in a sample, which is a native semen sample. On the other hand, if you look at sperm, which is retrieved from the female reproductive tract, either in the cervical canal, when uh, post, uh, post cortical cervical mucus is aspirated to look at the spermatozoa or from the uterine cavity, and on the right side, you see an oocyte with the sperm, which is attached on the zona pellucida. And these sperm are basically also called zona pellucida preferred or zona pellucida selected sperm. So when these spermatozoa were stained, there was a predominance of normal uh, spermatozoa. And this sample of spermatozoa was much more homogeneous compared to what is seen in the native sample. So this is where the strict criteria origin is, and this is how strict criteria defines sperm morphology only into normal and abnormal forms. Next slide, please. So sperm morphology involves a series of steps, and the first step here is mere preparation. 
And on the right side, I've provided an example of a technologist in a lab who's uh, working on a semen sample. So essentially the steps are listed and the most important step is to always vortex the semen sample for 10 seconds, making sure that the sample aliquot is representative and there's no heterogeneity introduced into morphology assessment because you had an incompletely mixed sample. The smears are prepared in duplicate and before removing the second aliquot, make sure you always um, vortex the sample again. And uh, the smearing technique, I will provide some of the examples where it will be different from just using a normal um, neat semen sample. Next slide. So the smear preparation is done by feather feathering technique and clean frosted slides are used. As you can see on the image on the right side, uh, they are labeled with the patient identifiers. You apply a 10 microliter droplet or a 20 microliter um, if the sample is more concentrated. And the second slide on the top you can see is basically used to pull the drop of the semen along the surface of the slide. And as a result, you obtain a uniform feather-like thin smear. And um, the second uh, image shows the wrong technique. So it is um, labeled with the red cross, never push the droplet it is always a pull through technique and uh, done at an angle of 45 degrees within a second. Next slide. So this I'm going to show a practical demonstration. We have the slides labeled here, the frosted slides and the slide to make the smear. So the water sink is done, then the 10 microliter droplet, it's aspirated, it's placed upon the slide at the frosted end, and then the other slide is taken, the plain slide, to make the smear, and this will show you the technique. It is used at 45 degree angle. Within a second, a thin smear is prepared, and a second smear is prepared again uh, to have two duplicate uh, smears for one sample because we will do the replicate measurement. Here I have shown that in cases where the sperm concentration are low, for example, if the sperm concentration is 2 million, then we need to concentrate the sample. And this is achieved by centrifugation, the speed and the time is given. And then on the right side, um, it's shown that, you know, the supernatant is all aspirated, only 100 microliter of the sample uh, supernatant is left. And this is used to reconstitute the pellet, which is at the bottom, and make sure that you do not concentrate more than 50 million. So that is the ideal concentration with which you can use a 10 microliter droplet. And again, um, make the smears with the concentrated sample, but do make a note on the sheet, on the worksheet, that this was a centrifuge sample. Next slide. So here is uh, the steps of the staining protocol. The first is the stain that we use. It's a diff quick stain. The right side shows the kit we have, fixative staining solution one and two. Staining solution one has the eosinophil exanthine. The staining solution two has basophilic thiazine. And on the top, I provided an example of a nice smear with, uh, you know, using the diff quick stain. Next slide. So here is uh, the details of the staining protocol. Once the smear is prepared and is air dried, then the first step is, and we have the working solutions on the right side. The first is a fixative. So you have to fix the slide, dip it in the fixative for five times, 10 seconds each, and then again air dry the slide. And once the slide is fixed, then it has to be sequentially immersed in the diff quick staining solutions. So for staining solution one, it's three dips for 10 seconds each. And uh, for staining solution two, it's five dips. And then quickly rinse in the water. So here uh, on the slide right, we have an air uh, dried slide, which will be first fixed in the fixative. So it's pulled up and then dipped in the fixative. It has to be a slow dip of 10 seconds each, making sure all of the slide is exposed to the fixative. And then you dab off the extra on the paper towel. And then it will be put on the slide rack for drying. So once it's dried and fixed, then 
the slide will be immersed in uh, the solution one. And as you can see, it's a slow dip for 10 seconds each and three times. And the extra solution is dabbed off. Then the solution two, which is the basophilic stain, it's dipped for five times, 10 seconds each. The extra solution will be dabbed off on the paper towel. And then uh, this would be immersed in the sterile water, quick rinse in the sterile water a couple of times to remove the extra stain so there isn't like too much background staining and you know you cannot do the morphology assessment correctly. So now it's air dry. So we go on to the next step. So mounting of the smear can be done. You can read the slides, morphology slides, both mounted as well as unmounted, but it is an advantageous procedure because you can use these as internal quality control. You can have them stored long time in case you need to go back and review the slide. On the right side, there is the example of the cytoseal. So two to three small drops are placed in the center of the uh, slide, which is stained, and then a cover slip is placed. It's important that the cover slip is positioned so the contact with the mounting media begins from the long side and no air bubbles get trapped. And then once the slide has been mounted, it is allowed to air dry for 30 minutes. Next slide. So how do we examine the smear quality by, and it is done by bright field object um, microscopy, but the quality of the smear depends on several factors. It includes the volume of the sample, the viscosity, the concentration, the angle of the dragging slide, smaller the angle, thicker, thinner the smear, speed of the smearing, quicker the movement, and then you'll have a good smear, nice feather uh, smear. So initially, the best option is to start with a 10 microliter droplet at an angle of 45 for one second. On the right side uh, is an image of a good stain smear, which shows the acrosome as uh, pale lavender. The post acrosome area is dark lavender. The mid piece is stained pink and the tails are stained all the way uh, very nicely. And the slide, uh, you know, in a high power is showing about 8 to 10 sperm, which is ideal. This is from the WHO 5th edition. Next slide. Preparation of a smear from uh, another situation could be a viscous sample, which um, can be treated with a proteolytic enzyme chymotrypsin. And this sample is then incubated at 37 degrees for 30 minutes. And once it is liquefied, then it is ideal to prepare the smear. And it should not be done with a highly viscous sample because you will get a thick, uneven smear and will not be able to do morphology correctly. Next. So morphological evaluation of a stain smear uh, is done using a 100x objective. It is oil immersion. It's bright field object, uh, ob objective. What is important is you need to do morphological evaluation of all the spermatozoa that are there in a high power field and you know, sequentially assess all the spermatozoa. So this, if it is done, will avoid any you know, bias or selection of particular spermatozoa. And it is important to understand the immersion oil as well as the glass slide and the mounting media all have the same refractive index and this prevents refraction of light, and you will be able to assess the sperm morphology correctly. On the right, you can see a teaching microscope where uh, the assessment is being done. Next slide. So here, um, continuing with the bright field um, microscopy, examining the stain quality under these optics, the head is stained pale blue or lavender, and in the acrosomal region, in the post-acrosomal, it is either dark blue or dark lavender. The mid piece shows some red staining. And if there is excessive residual cytoplasm around the mid piece, this also will be stained pink. On the right side, I provided an example from our own lab with the diff quick staining, and you can appreciate how good the staining is with clear demarcation and clear differentiation of the spermatozoa. Next. So how do we assess the morphological normal spermatozoa? The normal form, both sperm head and tail must be normal. 
the sperm has a smooth oval in shape. The acrosome is 40 to 70 percent of the head area, and no more than two vacuoles, and no vacuole in the post acrosomal region. So on the right side, I've provided some practical hints for sperm morphology grading, and here we have to ensure that we are following the WHO fifth edition guidelines. And any sperm with borderline form or morphology will be classified as abnormal. This can be achieved by doing scoring and training sessions using a teaching microscope equipped with a video camera and a TV screen. Next slide, please. So the categories of sperm defects can be head defects, neck piece defects, or tail defects. The head, different forms, large, small, tapered, amorphous, neck and mid piece defects, asymmetrical insertion, bent necks, Thick or irregular mid piece, um, tail defects, they could be multiple tails, they could be coiled tails, or excessive residual cytoplasm is characterized as normal when it is more than one third of the sperm head size. On the right side, uh, some of the hints again, semen sample will contain spermatozoa with different abnormalities, and we have to be mindful about that. And these result from defective spermatogenesis or epididymal inflammation where you could see a lot of pyriform uh, shaped heads. And the same spermatozoa can have more than one abnormalities. And this is called mixed abnormalities within the same spermatozoa. Next slide. So training in sperm morphology is very important, as Dr. Henkel had talked about, correct assessment of sperm morphology. And to avoid a lot of uh, lack of objectivity or not following the strict edition guidelines, we need to train the technologists to the highest level. And this is achieved by using teaching microscope, doing side-by-side -side morphology. And then we have the training document where uh, both the trainee and the trainer will assess the same slide and then you know assess if the trainee is doing well or if corrective action is required. Next. So the take-home message is um, from uh, my talk that sperm morphology has been used for almost over three decades, and it is a key parameter in semen analysis, which is predictive of the fertilizing ability of the spermatozoa, as was reflected upon by Dr. Henkel as well. And the important step and the key is to follow the WHO fifth edition's guideline consistently. And how do we achieve this? By doing uh, training, dedicated training, and smear preparation, staining, evaluation, and making sure that the training is to the highest level for having precise and accurate results and results which the clinicians can be confident of. And um, while we are doing uh, the training, we also have to do ongoing quality control uh, monitoring and any type of error must be identified and then steps taken to mitigate or resolve the problems. Next slide. So this is um, our group in front of the Andrology Center with some of the ART trainees over um, three years ago. And thank you very much for your attention. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sejal, for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, now we move to the second part of this uh, lecture, which will be covered by uh, Dr. Rakesh Sharma. Rakesh is an associate professor at the Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western. He is one of my associate here in andrology. He is the assistant technical supervisor of our andrology laboratory. We have three labs here in Cleveland Clinic. He has uh, done a lot of research over the last uh, 28 years since he has been working uh, in Cleveland Clinic. And uh, he is uh, going to be uh, uh, speaking today. Uh, let me uh, move to the next. Uh, his presentation uh, is a continuation of the first presentation which uh, which started with Dr. Gupta. Now he's going to talk about the quality control in his sperm morphology. Rakesh, you can begin. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk on the quality control in sperm morphology. Next slide, please. 
The learning objectives are the correct setup of the microscope and the quality of the stains. Understand some of the possible causes of poor sperm quality and understand the correct definition of strict criteria. Look into some of the measurement techniques that can be used in correct identification of the sperm dimensions and finally the correct reporting of the results. Next slide please. The microscope setup is very important and the correct field, whether it is a bright field or phase contrast, should be correctly selected. And in case of sperm morphology, the bright field is used. We use a objective, which is a 100x objective and a 10x eyepiece. The use of an ocular micrometer is very critical in sperm morphology. We cannot just look at the sperm and say if it is normal or abnormal. The micrometer is a small scale which can be inserted in the eyepiece and it is, it is specific to the make of the microscope, but it is easy. You can check with your vendor and they will be able to provide the correct reticle. It is simply a scale which has graduations and each graduation is equal to one micrometer. Also, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, we need to use the correct refractive index of the immersion oil. The slides should be cleaned and they can be cleaned with a lens cleaner solution as well as using a lint-free wipes. A differential counter is also important for correctly categorizing the sperm either as normal or abnormal. Next slide, please. Sperm morphology remains one of the most controversial semen parameter. And as you heard in the first presentation by Professor Henkel, the, the categorization of sperm morphology is important because it has shown incorrect morphology can lead to a low predictive value, which is seen in the most recent publications even though the sperm morphology in the earlier studies in the 80s and the 90s showed very strong predictive value with the ERT outcome. In addition, sperm morphology is very subjective. And what I mean by that is when we're looking at the sperm concentration or the sperm motility, it is easy to identify the correct concentration and the correct motility. However, if we are just using uh, a visual assessment, it is very difficult to characterize the sperm either as normal or abnormal. So both the correct staining, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, the correct identification is very important. And there can be significant differences even among the technicians as well as the laboratories. And there are many problems which are associated with the preparation of the smear, the staining technique used, as well as the the WHO criteria that is used to report the results of the morphological evaluation. And in our, in our setting, we use the fifth edition and we recommend that most of the labs do and they should use the fifth edition of WHO for morphology assessment. Next slide, please. So come, some of the common stains that have been used over the years were the Papaniklau stain, which was considered as the gold standard. And in addition, there was the short stain. Both stains, they provide similar results. And the challenge with these stains is that they were very time consuming and involved many steps. And with the IVF labs and the laboratories, which required to report the results in a shorter turnaround time, these stains were not very uh, suitable and over the years, rapid stains were introduced, such as the disquick stain, which Dr. Gupta mentioned. And there was also another stain that was introduced, which is called the test simplex. And these were the pre-stained slides on which you could use a small drop of a semen sample. And it did not involve the smearing of the sample, and it did not require any ear drying. Next slide, please. The test simplex was used mostly in the IVF labs, which did not have an endrology setup, and where the use of volatile reagents were prohibited. This slide shows the comparison of the three staining methods, the Papaniklau, the Shore, and the test simplex. And as you can see from here, 
the head defects, the mid mid piece defects, and the tail defects were very similar when the slides were stained with papani cloud or with the short stain. But if you look at the test simplex results, we see that this test simplex showed a uh, underscoring of the tail defects as is clearly identified over here. And this shows that the test simplex is not a very uh, effective method to stain the slides. And this method is not recommended by the WHO as well. Next slide, please. In this slide, I want to cover what are some of the quality control criteria that can, that can be used to obtain good quality smears. As Dr. Gupta mentioned, the preparation of thin smear is very important, and this can be accomplished by using a smaller aliquot of the sample, as well as making the smear at an angle of 45 degrees and correctly following the steps of the uh, staining protocol. In this case, we are using the diff quick. And on to the right is an example of a good stain smear where you see clearly differentiated stains in the acrosome as well as in the post acrosome region. Next slide, please. In this slide, I would like to highlight the definition of strict criteria, specifically when the slides are stained using diff quick stain. The head length should be five to six micrometer. The head width should be two and a half to three and a half micrometer. The mid piece should be one and a half times or seven to 10 micrometer and the tail approximately 45 micrometer in length. There should be no neck mid piece or tail defects. And in this case, all borderline forms are considered abnormal and the normal value by strict criteria is 4% or more than 4% of normal forms. Next slide, please. In this slide, I will highlight the importance of using a micrometer. In the first image, you see a micrometer which has a crossbar with X axis as well as Y axis showing five centimeter graduations. And each graduation is one micrometer in each, each unit is one micrometer. And to examine the dimension of the sperm, we place the reticle on the sperm, and in this case, the second image on the y-axis, we can check the width of the sperm head. And in this case, the width is three micrometer. And the next slide, we place the reticle lengthwise so that we can measure the length on the x-axis. And in this example, the length is five micrometer. So this is an example of a normal sperm dimension. Next slide, please. Quality control is very important in sperm morphology assessment. And the quality control involves not only preparing a good smear, but also the stains, the quality of the stains that are used. And I would like to spend a few minutes to highlight the importance of the quality control in sperm morphology. It's very important to check the reagents, the stock reagents, for the expiration dates, they should be current. It is also important to check the working stains and look for any contamination of bacterial growth or an oily film, which we observe in specifically the diff quick solution two. If there is a contamination or a bacterial growth, it is important to replace the stain, prepare a fresh stain, and the frequency of the stain depends on the volume of the slides that are used. If a few slides are stained, the stains can be changed bi-weekly or monthly. And if the staining volume is high, it is recommended that the stains be changed weekly. On to the right is an example of how we monitor and document the quality control of the stains. We document the lot number of the fixating the solution one or the solution two, as well as the expiration date of each reagent. And below you see the dates on which the stains are replaced. So we can document very clearly and identify if there's an issue with the stain and troubleshoot where the problem occurred. Next slide, please. In addition, a quality control smear can be used to check the quality of the smear as well as the quality of the stain. And for this, a donor sperm can be used. 
the slides are air dried and they can be fixed and this quick staining is used. And as you can see on the image to the right, the acrosomal staining is light lavender in color. The post acrosome is dark lavender in color and the tail show very good definition. And this is an example of a very good stained slide. If the staining is poor, it is recommended to repeat the smear and stain the slide and obtain a slide of optimal quality. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, I would like to highlight some of the causes of poor smear quality or poor staining quality. In scenario one, what we encounter is that many times there may not be enough sperm on the smear. And some of the possible causes for this could be that the sample has a low sperm concentration or the patient is oligozoospermic, so the concentration of the sample is less than 15 million, or the sample could be poorly prepared and the smear is not of the optimal quality. The solution for this is, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, we can concentrate the sample and we can make a fresh smear and stain it again. Next slide, please. This is an example where we find that the acrosomes are overstained. As you can see in the image to the right, the acrosome is overstained and we cannot differentiate the acrosome and the post acrosome area. And this is because too much time was spent in the diff quick stain too. And the simple solution to avoid this is to reduce the time in diff quick solution too. And if necessary, we can give an additional wash in sterile water. So this is an example of a poor stained smear. Next slide, please. In many instances, we might encounter samples which have very high round cell concentration, as you can see in the image to the right. And this is because of the increased number of round cells that we encounter in some samples. The solution to this is we can dilute the sample if the concentration is normal and prepare fresh smears and they will minimize the presence of round cells and make the scoring easier. Next slide, please. In some instances, we might find that the sample is viscous as Dr. Gupta highlighted in her presentation. And this is also the reason why the smear may be difficult to prepare or it might result in an uneven smear. And in such instances, we can make use of a proteolytic enzyme such as strypsin, liquefy the sample completely, and then proceed to make the smear and stain the sample. Next slide, please. In the last example, I would like to highlight, sometimes we might end up with the smear, which has overcrowding of the spermatozoa, as you can see on to the right. And this is because the sperm concentration in the original sample is very high, and we must avoid high concentration of the sample when making the smear, and this can be accomplished by diluting the sample with a phosphate buffer saline, and depending on the concentration, we can use a one is to one concentration or even a higher dilution to obtain good smear and a good stain slide. Next slide, please. Having seen the different causes of poor quality smear, once we score the, once we score the sample, in duplicate, how do we assess that these results are acceptable? In this scenario, I would like to give you an example that if we score the slide and we find the two readings for normal sperm are 18 and 9, the rounded average is 14%, and the difference between the two readings is 9%. So are these results acceptable? On to the right is a table from the WHO 2010 or the fifth edition which shows that if the average difference is of 12 to 16 percent, then the acceptable difference in the two results should be less than 7 percent. And from, the, from our scenario, we find that the average is 14 percent and the difference is 9 percent. So the difference is higher than the acceptable uh, difference, and therefore this result is not acceptable and the slide should be rescored. Next slide, please. This is an, another example where we find the two readings are 10 and 14%. So the average is 12% and the difference between the two reading is 
So are these results acceptable? So looking at the table on the right, for an average of 12 to 16, the acceptable difference is 7%. And since we have a difference of 4%, these results are acceptable. And then these results can be reported for the patient's morphology result. The take home message from my talk is number one, the microscope setup is very important, but equally important is the use of a micrometer for the accurate scoring of the normal sperm measurement. We cannot simply eyeball and say that the sperm is normal or abnormal. That will result in a big difference in the results. Also, the smear quality as well as the stain quality is important, and therefore the quality control is very critical. If we find that the smear or the stain is of poor quality, we must investigate and correct the cause of poor sperm quality, and we must have the results which are acceptable, and this is important when we're reporting the results for the patient sperm morphology. Next slide, please. This is a group from our staff as well as some uh, interns. Next slide, please. And this is a view of Cleveland Clinic. And I would like to thank you for your attention to my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rakesh, uh, for your uh, very nice presentation. So the next presentation uh, is again by uh, Dr. Sharma, and it will be followed by Dr. Gupta. And uh, the speaker are going to start uh, with a sperm quality evaluation by strict criteria. So here, the emphasis of the talks are going to be actual process of scoring the slides using the fifth edition criteria. So they are going to walk you through each and every step as it was in the previous presentation where they told you about how to prepare the smear, how to uh, do uh, the staining, and then uh, how to actually do the con uh, quality control. So the focus here is uh, by virtue of examples is to, to show how the actual evaluation is done. So Rakesh, you can begin. We are running a little bit late, so let us uh, continue. Thank you, Dr. Agawal. So the talk will be sperm quality evaluation by the strict criteria. Next slide, please. The learning objectives are to understand the normal sperm morphology using the WHO fourth edition, as well as giving example using the fifth edition. We will also learn examples of morphological abnormalities, learn the correct use of a micrometer for measuring sperm dimensions, and recognize examples of normal sperm measurement. Next slide, please. This slide shows the sperm dimensions utilizing the WHO fourth edition or the 99 edition and also comparing it with the WHO fifth or the 2010 edition. If you look out to the left, the WHO fourth edition, the normal sperm cutoff was 14% or more than 14% normal forms and all borderline forms were considered abnormal. If you look into the WHO fifth edition or the 2010 edition, the normal sperm cutoff is now 4% or more than 4%. These results are reported, reported as the fifth center reference ranges, and all borderline forms are considered abnormal. Next slide, please. These two smears show examples of normal and abnormal sperm which, which we encounter when we look into the morphology slides. So the same smear can have different forms, and this is represented in these two images. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, I want to illustrate the examples of abnormal sperm heads, and also on to the left, you have the example in the insert of how a normal sperm looks like. So it is easy comparison to see the difference between a normal sperm form as well as abnormal sperm. And this is an example of amorphous heads. So these are three images which are distinctly different and they look totally different than what a normal sperm should look as you see in the insert. Next slide, please. This is again another morphological defect. And in this case, this is called the tapered heads. 
And these are the act, these are the sperm heads, which are long, slender, and they are cigar shaped, and they are significantly different than what a normal sperm looks as seen in the insert. Next slide, please. This is an example of small heads, and in the three images, you can see the sperm head is significantly smaller than the normal looking sperm, which is seen in the first image. Next slide, please. This is an example of sperm with small acrosomes. And as Dr. Gupta mentioned that the sperm head should have 40 to 70% of the acrosome. These are examples which absolutely show no sperm or they have very poor sperm showing the acrosome area. And this is a common feature which we find in patients who are having varicoceles. Next example. This is an example of globozoospermia, where there is a preponderance of sperm which look round, and there's a complete absence of the acrosome. So these are examples as shown by the arrows of the sperm which look round, and they have complete absence of the acrosome. Next slide, please. This is an example of midpiece defects, and the midpiece the fact is because of the presence of an excessive residual cytoplasm that is present in the midpiece, and these are the three examples of the type of midpiece defects that we see in samples from the patients. And this midpiece defect is the cause for the abnormal cytoplasm seen right after the sperm head. Next slide. And lastly, this is an example of abnormal tails. And in the first image, we can see the tail is bent as well as coil tail. The second image shows the presence of a double tail. And the last image on the right shows a coil tail. Next slide, please. So again, I would like to highlight the dimensions so that we know what a normal sperm should look like. Next slide, please. If we have to measure the sperm dimension, we use the micrometer and we place the sperm on the Y axis and we can measure the sperm width, which in this case is three micrometer. And next we can place the sperm and look for the sperm length on the X axis. And in this case, the measurement shows five micrometer. So as per the fifth edition, this sperm will have a normal sperm dimension. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, I would like to show you examples how we measure accurately the sperm head and the sperm weight. So the first, first image shows the sperm, which we presume looks normal, but we want to confirm that this indeed is normal. So we place the reticle on the sperm length. And in this case, the length of the sperm is 5.1 micrometer. And then we place the sperm, we place the reticle on the sperm weight. And we measure the width, and in this case, on the image to the right, the width of the sperm is 3.1 micrometer. So this sperm shape would be categorized as a normal sperm. And now we can appreciate how accurately the measurement is important in categorizing the sperm as normal and abnormal. Next slide, please. This is an, another example where we are measuring the length as well as the width of the sperm. And in this case, the length is 5.1 micrometer and the width is 3.5 micrometer. So again, this is a sperm with normal dimensions. Next slide, please. Now that you have seen the different types of abnormalities as well as the normal sperm, I would like to give you a short quiz. And here are four images. The four images are classified based on the head shape, the head defects or other defects, the midpiece defects, and the tail defects. And I would like you to take a short quiz in the next 20 seconds and see, based on these criteria, how would you classify these four images either as normal or abnormal? So take a few seconds and categorize these into normal and abnormal sperm. Next slide, please. So let's review how you classified these four images. Looking at image number one, if you look at the head shape, it is abnormal and it is flat and the midpiece is thick. 
So overall sperm classification for image number one would be a category of abnormal sperm. Looking at image number two, the head shape is normal. There are no other head defects. The midpiece is normal. So this sperm will be categorized as normal. If you look at image number three, the head shape is normal, but the midpiece is thick and very long, and this sperm would be categorized as abnormal. Finally, if you look at the image number four, the sperm shape looks normal, but the acrosome is small. It is less than 40%. And therefore, we will categorize this sperm as abnormal. Next slide, please. So in my presentation, I have walked you through the correct measurement of sperm dimension, and these allow the correct classification of the sperm as either as normal or abnormal. So it is very important to differentiate the classification of the sperm into normal or abnormal category. The use of a micrometer is extremely important for the correct measurement of the head dimension. And uh, ongoing training is recommended to correctly assess the sperm morphology. Following these steps will help in the accurate identification of the normal sperm forms. Next slide, please. This is our group, and uh, these are the summer interns. Next slide, please. This is a beautiful image of the Cleveland Clinic, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, um, Rakesh, uh, for a beautiful presentation. Um, now we move very quickly to the next speaker, uh, which is uh, going to be Dr. Gupta. So let me um, begin her, and uh, she will continue. Um, and she will discuss the quality assurance aspect, uh, uh, and she will define what is the quality assurance with respect to sperm morphology. So Sejal, you can jump in and uh, try to keep it very concise. We are running late. Yeah. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Agarwal. And um, my topic was introduced. So the careful analysis of sperm morphology uh, needs a great deal of expertise and implementation of uh, quality assurance in a meticulous manner. The learning objectives for my presentation are training in sperm morphology and competency assessment, quality assurance for sperm morphology evaluation, proficiency testing and external quality control, and then uh, tips for optimizing sperm morphology and understanding the sources of error. Next slide, please. So, as alluded to earlier speakers uh, by Dr. Professor Henkel, lack of standardization in sperm morphology is a major issue, and this results from differing techniques of smear preparation, differences in staining procedures, and also uh, lack of training. So, how do we do the training in sperm morphology? And in our laboratory, we have um, strict um, guidelines. We have a SOP for training the technologists using a teaching microscope and then using documents, you know, having them assess at least 20 sperm morphology samples and then making sure that the trainer and the trainee are doing the scoring together. I provided examples on the right side of the average sperm normal forms for the trainee, which was 11%. And the trainer 12%. And so no corrective action was required because the acceptability criteria were met for both um, assessments. If you look at the second, there is the trainee who has assessed 21 and 23 with an average of 22% normal forms, whereas the trainer has an average of 7%. So definitely the difference is very wide and corrective action was required. And then we have to go back and train Again, the trainee in you know correct use of optical micrometer and correct identification of normal sperm forms. Next slide. So competency assessment is done because what has been observed why there is lack of standardization is because there is high intertechnician variability, and for any high complexity testing, we 
do competency assessment. This is done by the technical supervisor as per the Central Federation guidelines. It's done by direct observation, which is side by side scoring, monitoring and recording the results, review of intermediate test results and uh, evaluation of previously tested or internal quality control samples and assessment of problem solving skills. So on the right, I provided the competency assessment form where it is broken down into steps. We quiz the technologist. We look at each step, including staining, quality control, staining steps, scoring the diff quick smears. Next, please. And so on, and then the reporting of the results. And we also see that the infra technician variability in terms of the replicate measurements is not very high. And then once they meet all the criteria, we say that they are competent in performing sperm morphology. But if they fail, then I will have to go back and reassess the competency. Next. So to quiz you all, uh, there are two smears on the left and the right. So have a look and you know see which smear is uh, a good quality smear. So if you have thought it through, I will get, come up with the answer on the right side, as you can see, this is a smear which is performed in our lab, and there is no background contamination. The spermatozoa are showing clear demarcation for the pre-acrosomal and the post-acrosomal region, uh, being the acrosome being light lavender, the post-acrosome being dark lavender, clear demarcation of the midpiece, and then the tail. Whereas on the left, it's a poor quality smear. The demarcation is not seen. Next. So quality assurance is an ongoing process, both quality control, quality assurance, and quality improvement. And one has to have certain quality indicators. So here I'm providing an example of a quality indicator. How do we assess inter-technician wearability? So there are different plots, and these are given in the WHO fifth edition manual. But what I have provided an example is a uh, bland Altman plot where we have the same morphology smears that's scored by two technologists. And on the x-axis, you have the average person normal forms. On the y-axis, we have the difference in the person normal forms between the two technologists. And the line in the middle is the mean, and then we have plus minus two standard deviations. So this is very good correlation between the two technologists. All the values except one are within plus minus two standard deviations. That means there is a no intertechnician variability in terms of multiple samples for sperm morphology that have been assessed. Next slide. So it is also important when we are tracking the quality indicators, we have to see and go back and assess where the error is arising. So the different steps have to be you know, evaluated and check and see where the error is arising, and then accordingly uh, propose or mitigate the problem. So some of the examples are the microscope is not being used correctly. It's incorrect magnification. Maybe the technologist is not using the optical micrometer correctly, as was you know, highlighted by Dr. Sharma, or uh, there are subjective techniques being used. They are not strictly following the fifth edition guidelines and so on, poor smear preparation. So basically it's a quality improvement process as well as a quality assurance process that you look at all the steps, identify the error, and then the resolution is in terms of providing training or having them read the uh, standard operating procedure or having them you know, assess some internal quality controls or external quality control. There's also an X bar chart where they could assess the same sample multiple times and see what is the agreement each time they have scored the sample. Next slide. So uh, there are colleges which send uh, smears for proficiency testing. And in the United States, the agency is called College of American Pathologists. So this is uh, deemed by the health administration in the United States, and they provide quality control analytes or external quality control uh, analytes twice a year. And 
every six months we get to analyze. We have to test these analyzed as patient samples, and then we report them as per the WHO fifth edition criteria. We have to meet the uh, acceptability criteria, which are provided by the College of American Pathologists. And if not, then we have to take corrective action. Next slide. So these are the actual results. Uh, this is from a previous evaluation. And um, our results are for both the analytes 4%, so that is normal, 2%, which is abnormal. And then on the right, they have provided the mean of all the labs um, that had done the testing for these analytes. And the STIs are minus 0.4 and minus 0.5. So these are very tight, and our results were acceptable. And um, this is what I've highlighted, the acceptability criteria within the box, mean plus two minus standard deviation. And sometimes if there is lack of consensus, then they might grade the results as 26. And this grade is that you do your own internal quality control, have all your technologists after the last date of submission of the results, uh, do the assessment, and then you come up with the own within the lab mean plus minus standard deviation and then uh, the director which is dr agarwal will review them and see if they are acceptable next slide so overall take-home messages that quality control and quality assurance are an ongoing process so they never stop and each step of the procedure needs to be monitored and meticulous quality control implementation at each step is necessary. And this is a requirement for lab accreditation, as well as making sure that your morphology results are precise, they are accurate. The second is proficiency testing. It again, if the lab is meeting the CAP guideline, uh, then you are reporting accurate results. It's a validation of your laboratory results. And wherever the quality assurance process shows that there is errors or there are problems, then you go back and look at the root cause analysis. And depending on what is the root cause or where uh, the step which is not being performed correctly, corrective action with appropriate training and quality control intervention is essential. And this is an important component of overall quality assurance for sperm morphology as well as quality management. Next slide. And uh, I appreciate your attention for uh, this um, important aspect of sperm morphology, quality assurance, and uh, thank you very much. So the next speaker is our colleague, Dr. Neil Parik. Uh, Neil is uh, a clinical professor in the Department of Urology in Cleveland Clinic. He is fellowship trained in andrology and male infertility, and uh, he is, um, specializes uh, in the area of uh, andrology. Uh, so he's going to be um, presenting now the next talk. So let us uh, start his presentation. Hi, this is Dr. Neil Park. I am a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Urology at the Cleveland Clinic. In line with today's discussion on sperm morphology, I'd like to share my interpretation and clinical management of sperm morphology results. Today's lecture will consist of a series of seven clinical questions. Let's begin with the first one. We have a patient who has a clinical grade three varicocele, a sperm concentration of 40.5 million per milliliter and 60% motility with 2% normal sperm morphology. Should he be a candidate for varicocele repair? Now, for those not familiar with varicocele, a varicocele is a physical abnormality found in roughly 15% of men. When looking at patients with abnormal semen analysis, we found that varicocele is present in roughly 25% of this population. Now, the connection between varicocele and male cell fertility is not completely understood, but we do know that varicocele repair can improve sperm parameters and pregnancy rates. In this specific patient with 2% normal morphology, but the remainder of his semen parameters within the normal range, he is considered to have isolated teratozoospermia, 
This is defined as less than 4% morphologically normal spermatozoa. Now the American Urologic Association and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine have guidelines outlining the criteria required to proceed with varicocele treatment. They are the following. Number one, the varicocele must be palpable. So either grade two or grade three clinical varicocele. Number two, the couple should have documented infertility. Number three, a female should have normal fertility or potentially correctable infertility. And number four, the male partner should have one or more abnormal semen parameters or sperm function tests. However, there is a caveat to these guidelines as there is significant controversy regarding the um, predictive value of isolated teratozoospermia. In fact, some may argue uh, against using isolated teratozoospermia to make any treatment or management decisions. However, in my clinical practice, we have found that varicocele repair ha does and can improve semen parameters. This includes morphology. There is also data to support these findings. Furthermore, we counsel patients on the potential of avoiding assisted reproductive techniques or downstaging the required assisted reproductive technique that may, that may be required after having a varicocele repaired. So to answer this specific question, in a patient with isolated uh, teratozoospermia, he does meet these four um, criteria, uh, and I believe a varicocele repair uh, is a good option. Question number two. We have a young 17-year-old male with a grade three varicocele. He has 10 million sperm per milliliter, 20% motility, and over 6% normal sperm morphology. Is he a candidate for varicocele repair? So this is a young adolescent with oligoestenozoospermia. Fortunately, the AUA and EAU guidelines have discussed the role of varicocele repair in the adolescent population. The biggest risk in this population is overtreatment, as many adolescents with a varicocele will have no problem achieving pregnancy later in life. However, there are two conditions that, that can um, help, help you decide on whether a varicocele should be performed. This includes impaired semen quality or a growth deterioration of the testicle or abnormal size as documented by serial clinical examination or scrotal ultrasound. So in this particular patient uh, with an abnormal semen analysis, it is reasonable to op offer varicocele repair. Now, if this were a patient with normal semen parameters and normal physical exam, uh, I commonly recommend reevaluation at one year or at two years with both uh, physical exam plus or minus a semen analysis to assess, to assess the semen parameters. Let's move on to question number three. We have a patient who presents with a sperm concentration of 40 million per milliliter. He has 50% sperm motility, but his morphological examination showed all sperm without an acrosome. What are the chances of successful pregnancy in absence of female factors? So this is a patient who has globozoospermia. This is defined as sperm without an acrosome, and this is a rare genetic etiology or condition with an incidence of less than 0.1%. Men who present to the clinic typically have a normal physical and clinical characteristic. They have normal mental development and they have a normal hormonal status. Unfortunately, the only viable treatment option for this patient is IVF and ICSI with or without oocyte activation. Dr. London in 1994 was the first to report a clinical pregnancy and delivery after a second cycle of IVF and ICSI. Fertilization rates are poor, roughly 12 to 30 percent, and they have, these patients have a higher rate of fertilization failure than IVF ICSI performed for other causes. Question number four. A patient presents with sperm concentration of 30 million per milliliter and 60 percent motility. The morphological examination showed all sperm were of round shape or globozoospermia. 
how will you manage this patient? So just as we discussed in the previous question, these patients typically present uh, with normal phenotypic characteristics and a normal hormonal profile. However, IVF ICSI is the only viable treatment option. So these patients should be offered genetic counseling and strongly recommended to evaluate the risk of transmitting a chromosomal defect or a genetic mutation uh, when they undergo IVF ICSI. There are no reports of recurrent constitutional chromosomal anomalies in patients with globozoospermia. Question number five. So we have a patient who presents with 50 million sperm per milliliter, a 50% motility, but 0% normal forms. How will you manage this patient? So this is a very common clinical scenario. Fortunately, we have a good working relationship with our reproductive endocrinologists, and they commonly refer male patients to our fertility clinic for further evaluation. In the past, many of these couples have been pushed to pursue IUI or IVF ICSI due to an abnormal morphology on the semen analysis. However, recent data does not support this practice. In fact, the majority of pre and fertile men had sperm morphologies values in the re abnormal range. You know, given this fact, it is very important for patients to be evaluated in the clinic and have a complete history and physical exam. Furthermore, uh, you must discuss timed intercourse prior to proceeding with any sort of assisted reproductive technique such as IUI or IVF. Because uh, of the controversy uh, and the predictive value of morphology, timed intercourse would be the next best step for this patient. If you look at this slide, there, there was no significant difference in IUI pregnancy rates for couples with severe teratozoospermia compared to controls with normal morphology. This is also demonstrated in patients who underwent IVF ICSI. So men with severe teratozoospermia, there was no difference in IVF ICSI outcomes. A meta-analysis of studies from 1986 to 2009 failed to find a relationship between sperm morphology and clinical pregnancy rates with IVF or ICSI. So again, going back to the fact that these patients should be advised on time intercourse, we should also assess them for any modifiable risk factors such as smoking, uh, lack of exercise, alcohol intake, we can also consider assessing their oxidative stress status and may offer antioxidants as a potential treatment option. Uh, however, much can be done before pursuing any sort of assisted reproductive technique in this particular scenario. Moving on to question number six. We have a couple that is trying to conceive via IUI. There are no female factors. The sperm morphology is only 1%. What are their odds of conceiving compared to another couple with 15% normal sperm forms? So again, similar to the previous question, that there has been no statistical difference in IUI pregnancy rates among patients with varying morphology results. No significant difference in IUI pregnancy rates for couples with severe teratospermia compared to controls with normal morphology. So for this particular couple, uh, the important thing is to reassure that this patient that timed intercourse is also an option, but if would, they would like to pursue IUI, their odds of conceiving are no different than a patient with 15% normal sperm forms. I find this very uh, an important fact because of the stress that this may uh, have on these patients. Many of these patients are referred from other uh, practices or institutions and are told that they have no normal shaped sperm and this can be very distressing. However, it's important to explain the, 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 the statistics and the studies to these patients uh, to help alleviate some of these stressors, uh, which stress can also have a negative impact on uh, fertility as well. Now, finally, question number seven, we have a patient who had a semen analysis done in China in 2018. He then saw an infertility specialist at the Cleveland Clinic in 2019, and we can see both semen analysis below. So you can 
see similar semen concentration, 30 million and 28 million per milliliter, respectively, 50% motility versus 45%. The main difference here is in morphology, 15% initially, and now 2% on the most recent semen analysis. How would we manage this patient? So, as you may have already gathered from the previous lectures, there's significant inter and intra observer variability when it comes to not only morphology, but the semen analysis. So that is why we find it very important to repeat the semen analysis uh, for any patient that comes to our clinic. And we like to separate it by approximately one month if possible. I would obtain a complete medical history and physical examination for this patient. Again, looking for any modifi modifiable risk factors that we can discuss and would also uh, offer uh, sperm DNA fragmentation or, or some other sort of advanced sperm testing as this patient has been uh, has been having infertility for roughly uh, one year of, of time at least. Prior to offering any sort of assisted reproductive technique or donor sperm or adoption, it's important to review uh, that these patients were performing timed intercourse appropriately. And, and once you have done, taken all the steps in the workup and management of a male infertility patient, you can then also offer and discuss any sort of assistic reproductive technique or donor sperm or adoption. This concludes uh, our lecture today on the clinical evaluation of sperm morphology. I hope you found this useful. And if there's any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Neil, uh, for your great presentation. Uh, Neil is uh, actually in the operating room right now, but this was a recorded presentation which he recorded over the weekend. So now let us uh, go to the concluding part of uh, uh, our presentation, which I'm going to start. Let me uh, try to conclude these uh, presentations or series of presentations that were given by our team. Uh, to summarize um, uh, these lectures on morphology, a strict criteria morphology can predict his sperm fertilizing ability, as you heard from Professor Henkel. A strict criteria is relevant in clinical decision making for infertile couple. Next, differentiation of normal and abnormal sperm needs good smear preparation and staying quality, as you heard from Dr. Gupta. The use of micrometer is recommended for accurate measurement of sperm dimension, as you heard from Dr. Sharma. Important, it is important to identify sources of error and do a root cause analysis to rectify the error, not to place the blame, but to really find the solution which can really prevent it from happening again. And that is the spirit. Um, quality control and quality assurance, both are very extremely important not only for sperm morphology, but for everything else. Um, and in the United States uh, and maybe in many other countries, uh, this is an essential element for accreditation of the laboratory or for regulation and essential practices for good quality results. External quality uh, assurance or proficiency testing uh, is uh, an important tool in reporting accurate morphology results as explained by Dr. Gupta, and the interpretation of his morphology is important in the clinical management of infertile couple to advise correct ART procedure, as you as you heard from Dr. Neil Parekh. So um, now, now I want to announce our next presentation series of presentation that is going to happen in January, and uh, this will be uh, what we call as module one, part of the semen analysis. Here we are going to cover the ancillary semen test. If you look at the right panel, the learning objectives of this will be to learn about the leukocyte detection, leukocytospermia, and how we can measure it. A sperm vitality test by using nigrosine, uh, anti-sperm antibody screening, a special test for azospermic sample, and post vasectomy screen. So this will be the subject of uh, the topic for the next uh, um, uh, online training, and this will be on January 12 from 9 to 12. Uh, these are the speakers uh, for the next uh, program. As you saw for today, it will be the same panel. 
And uh, we want to thank our uh, speakers who have uh, been part of our program and a wonderful team of coordinators. And I want to convey my special thanks to Dr. Manesh and Dr. Renata, who have spent countless hours uh, in coordinating this program with our team of coordinators that are uh, seen in this picture. We also want to thank uh, our guests uh, and colleagues and collaborator, Dr. Damayanti, um, as well as Dr. Chris uh, Lysigang for uh, their help in creating the online survey, which will be offered uh, after the multiple choice. Uh, and uh, our team of uh, medical technologists, uh, Megan, Alisa, and Courtney for their fabulous work taking care of our patients. We want to thank uh, uh, David Reichling and David Wolfley for their webcast services. Hope uh, the scientific uh, uh, program uh, was, uh, um, was of good quality. We worked very, very hard uh, to prepare this uh, program just like uh, the previous one. Um, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed your participation today. So on behalf of members of my team at the American Center for Reproductive Medicine at Cleveland Clinic, I wish you well, have a wonderful evening, wonderful uh, afternoon, wonderful uh, day, or uh, for some of you, it's already uh, tomorrow or uh, Wednesday. So please uh, enjoy your day or sleep and uh, relax. Thank you. And this concludes our program for today. Thank you. Have a, have a great day. Bye-bye.